raise up our voices, raise up our hearts, Lord, knowing that you hear. Lord, you hear our cries, you hear our pleas, you hear our prayers. You hear the very innermost part of who we are as we would come to you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Lord, you don't deny us. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, guys, listen. Rain. Rain. See, that's, that's why we came in here tonight, because you can't hear that in the other building. Now, actually, if you're wondering what, what the, the, the change for tonight is, is it's based upon doing some reduct work in the sanctuary. We've found that uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit noisier than we expected it to be, so there's some changes being made, and we've got some folks that have just uh, blessed us as a fellowship that are coming in that are doing the work and providing the materials, and, uh, and, and we're, we're just thrilled. And so what we're going to see is uh, we'll be back in on Sunday. It shouldn't be a problem. We certainly are not going to try to cram everybody in here on Sunday. I don't know how we used to do it, but uh, we, we did at one point, at one point in time. And, and so the other thing that I want to do is I want to talk about what it took to make this happen. Now, we haven't been in here since November of last year. Is that correct? November? We got in before Christmas in the other building, right? So everything in here just kind of got disconnected. Everything just was, was set off to the side, not hooked up, not really working, not really anything that had to be done with it. The youth uses this room, but they've got a much simpler little process that they use. These guys have been working all week long just to bring stuff in here. And so tonight it was funny. I was, <laughs> I was telling somebody, hey, this is kind of cool. We may do this more often. And Michael looked at me and went, no. <laughs> no, we won't. We're going to get it one time and we're going to get it right. So anyway... For Mitch, for Michael, for all of those that had a hand, yep. And throughout the week this week, finding wires, tracing stuff down, getting it all hooked up. Now we know how it works. We know what makes it, makes it happen. So we'll be able to take and, uh, and, and add that back into the mix a little bit from time to time for other events. But anyway, we are so blessed to have the group of servants that we have here that can do something like this. I understand. I, I'm, I'm assuming that we're live streaming, Right. We're, we're everything that we normally do we're doing so for everybody that's at home good to see you we're in the old sanctuary i know it looks really weird you haven't dialed into the wrong church you're at the right church all right well this evening we're going to continue our study in the book of proverbs and we're going to be in proverbs 22 oh i'm not used to my wife is all the one thing that's good is she's all the way back there and still able to communicate clearly I'm actually going to talk about it in my message, so it's okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll catch up on that. Yeah, so we got that covered. So let's open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Proverbs chapter 22. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would just have your way with us. Open up your word to our hearts, to our minds. Lord, that not only would it become something that we receive, but it's something that becomes a part of who we are, that we would walk in it. And Lord, we would do so to your honor and your glory. And by doing so, that it would be a representation to the world around us of your power, of who you are as our good and loving God, the God that brought to humanity through your son, Jesus Christ, salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is there anything else I missed before I get started here? Okay, perfect. Hey, in verse 1 of chapter 22, we're going to start right in. It says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, names carry great power and association with them. Names can paint a picture. They can serve as reminders of people and places and things. You know, celebrities spend a long time, a lot of energy and effort trying to pick just the right name so that their fans will remember them. Sometimes they do a really good job, other times not so much. I think that one of the greatest names for a group that was ever put out there was the Beatles, all right? How many of you remember the Beatles? If you're over 40, you remember the Beatles. I mean, let's face it, they're iconic. Does anybody in here remember the Crabs? Really? There's one. <laughs> I didn't either. Solomon says that a good name is to be chosen. Now, it's not the name that you were given at birth. It's not the name that your parents gave you. I mean, after all, we didn't have a whole lot to do with that. If we had some say, we might have come up with something different. I've often wondered what they were thinking. 
I mean, some parents have come up with some really crazy, strange monikers that hang on their kids for their entire lives. And you think, what were you doing at the time that you named your child Nirvana? I mean, what's the deal? But the reality is, is what we see here is we see that there's an opportunity for us to choose a name, a name that is based upon who we are and how we live. And you might note that the word good that precedes the word name in your text is in italics. And this means that it didn't appear in the original writings, but it was added in by the translators. And in the original, it would have read, a name is to be chosen rather than great riches. The word good, though, is an obvious fit. I mean, it it works. It's a good translation. No one would choose a bad name over riches. And so we see that this fit is very accurate in its context. But what Solomon is saying is that we should live in a way that brings with it a good name, a good name that is supported by conduct and by character. With this in mind, the greatest name that we could ever hope to be associated with is the name above all names, the name at which every knee will bow, the name of the only one true Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord, we put on his name by calling ourselves Christians. The question is, is are we doing everything that we can to add his character to our lives? Are we living lives that are worthy of that name that we bear? Oh, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, maybe I should stop calling myself a Christian. (laughs) Don't. Before you would start to change your name or remove that which you're associated with, the key is more so that we would change our character, that we would change how we operate. I once heard of an account of an interaction that took place between Alexander the Great and one of his field officers. The officer had exercised some really poor judgment during times of battle and was thus summoned before his commander. And the account records more or less, the exchange happening in this way. Upon arrival before Alexander the Great, the officer stood and was asked to basically justify his conduct, and he was unable to. He was unable to justify the poor judgment that he had done in relationship to leading upon the battlefield. The account records that at this point in time that Alexander looked at him and said, Sir, what is your name? And the young officer replied, My name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great looked at him and said, then change your conduct or change your name. And what a poignant aspect of understanding. And I think that the same thing happens to us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But we have have a tremendous advantage over that which would be brought in our own strength. We've been given the tools to make changes to our character. How many of you know that? We have the tools. We've been Bring, brought to the point to where we have not only this opportunity through the Word of God, but we have an opportunity through the Spirit of God that would bring about the examples allowing us to see what character looks like within a godly man and a godly woman. We also have the opportunity to be a part of this tremendous fellowship, and in so doing, that we have the, 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 the example of the saints of God and the fellowship to encourage us to good works and to thus a good name. When we hear our commander say, change your conduct or change your name, very often it's coming also through an attack of the enemy that would tell us that we're not worthy of the name. Oh, but guys, don't listen. Don't change. Trust Jesus. Allow the Spirit of God to change your conduct that we may bear the name of Christ and bear a good name on his behalf. In verse 2, it says, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of all of them. God is the creator of all. Rich or poor, they're all equal before the Lord. And what this means is that men all have equal opportunity. But what it doesn't mean is that they'll have an equal outcome. Every person, regardless of status, can accept the free gift of salvation. This is the thing that's so amazing. Do you realize if salvation cost anything at all, there would be some that couldn't afford to pay the price? I mean, people want want to try to figure out why it is that God chose to make salvation through Jesus Christ completely free without any effort. And there's a lot of people that try to put a lot of effort into it. But let's face it. The only way that salvation could be accessible to all of mankind, regardless of position or or strength 
or intelligence or any of those aspects without us bringing anything. All we need to do to receive is believe. And if we will, if we'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if by faith we will exercise our choice in him, then it says by faith we'll be saved, lest anyone would boast. And here's where the equal opportunity and the equal outcome, though, come into play. Because while anyone can receive by faith, not all will choose to. Those who choose Christ will be made sons and daughters of God. Those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ have been inherited, have been made joint heirs with Christ to the kingdom of God. I mean, how cool is that? How many of you have ever thought, wow, I'm like in the kingdom. I have been brought in and I didn't do anything to deserve it. I've been made new in Christ and made joint heirs with him by God through his grace. And what a tremendous opportunity. But guys, here's the thing. Those that refuse have no boast. Those that refuse have absolutely no opportunity to be able to stand in that presence of God and do so in such a way where they will be received. God, when he looks upon humanity, he looks at everyone equally. Everyone has equal opportunities, the great equalizer. But not everybody will have equal outcome. There's only two kinds of people in the world. There's those that have accepted Jesus Christ and those that haven't accepted Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people that want to argue that because they want to talk about, well, there's those that have and those that haven't and those that are somewhere in between. The Bible doesn't describe an in-between. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. It's one of the two. There's not any place in the middle. Now, there's a lot of folks that are ain'ts currently at this moment that are willing and will soon be saints, and that's what we're hoping for. But there's some that will never cross over, never by faith put their trust in Jesus Christ. The Lord is the maker and the savior of all, but not all will choose him. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Have you ever not looked before you did something? You know what I'm talking about? You, you know, you, you sh- if you'd have just looked, you'd have seen what was coming, right? If we're going to be wise, we need to be those that are willing to look down the road and see where the road's going to take us. And while uh, it, people often will start down a road and never give it a second thought as to what is going to happen at the other end of that, and then they arrive at the destination and they're overwhelmed and they're distraught because they wound up exactly where they were going. All the time the road was leading them to the place that they had chosen. When I counsel people, I often will tell them that they hit exactly what they were aiming for. They were. They hit exactly what they were aiming for. And this often happens in relationship to, to marriage. And, and, and it's interesting because this is where that whole aspect of what's going to take off and start happening tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we relaunch Couples for Christ, our marriage group that's going to be meeting here. And, and it's after the summer break, so we're going to meet and we're going to, we're going to talk specifically about the fact that men and women in relationship have trouble. It's promised. We see it in the Word of God. If you're married, you're going to have trouble. And so it amazes me when people come to me and say, I don't understand why I have trouble in my marriage. It's like, well, because you don't realize that that's what comes with marriage. And it's a process. But there's also a process that happens. And one of the things that, that I think is... The, what are the better things in our life right now? How many of you have come to really depend upon GPS when you're going somewhere? GPS, right? Jeeps, right? No, GPS, right? right? Global positioning satellite that talks to you, right? I ask Siri for an address. Gives me turn-by-turn directions. And if it works, and, and I'm not going to say it doesn't always work because sometimes it doesn't. It's not foolproof. But it works better than asking for directions, which I will never do, because I'm a man. (laughs) But the cool thing about GPS, if it's working, if you get too far off the path, it will tell you, recalculating, (laughs) right? 
turn around. And it will tell us to either turn around and go back the way we came to get back on the right road, or it will reroute us in the direction of where it is that we should be going. And guys, this is one of the things that we look for in relationship to being on the right path, of being going in the right direction. It says that the prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. He looks down the road, he sees what's coming and recognizes it and turns away, deviates from it and stays out of it. And this is what we're hoping to do when we start looking at this aspect of, of building marriages and, and, and strengthening marriages, and strengthening people in their lives in relationship to, to how they're going to interact, is to look at where the pitfalls are. You're going to have problems. It goes without saying. There are going to be issues. But if you know where you're going, if you have a direction in mind, the Word of God and the time of fellowship and learning and trusting Him will cause you to be able to redirect and recalculate and stay upon the right path. Amen? By humility and fear, the Lord, our riches and honor and life. And thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. Another place where we see a benefit of the fear of the Lord. Now, we know that there's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. We know that there's all of these attributes that go along with the fear of the Lord. And now we see that it's riches and it's honor and it's even life itself emanate from this fear of the Lord. But then it talks about this snare of the perverse, the way of the perverse. And I think for the most part that most of us in here, I would hope, all right, don't put your hand up. I would hope that most of the people in the room do as much as they possibly can to stay clear of what is perverse, what's evil. We understand the need to guard our souls from that which comes from the enemy. But it's hard, isn't it? I mean, it's hard not to be exposed to influences of this world because they're everywhere. I mean, you can't drive down the road. You can't see a billboard. You can't be exposed to something on the radio or something on TV where there isn't this continual aspect of something that is perverse that is entering into the purview into our, our mindset, our, our, our minds in relationship to what's happening in the world. And as best as we can to avoid it, the outside seems to find a way to the inside. And whereas our homes are to be a refuge and there's to be a sanctuary and there's to be, I like the idea that when I can't do anything else out there in the world and the world is just ganging up and beating on me, I love to be able to run into the house of the Lord. I love to be able to come here. I know this is a place of sanctuary. It's a place that's set aside for the Lord. But guys, our homes need to be that way also. And we need to have our homes that are set aside to where we can come and we can have an asylum. We can have a sanctuary. We can have a place of refuge away from the things of the world. Unfortunately, for many of us, our homes are often the place where perversity is not only dwelling, but it's an invited guest. And yes, I'm going to go there, and we're going to talk about what it is that we allow into our house through the form of TV and media and other things that come in. One of my greatest concerns has to do with the effect that it has on kids in the home, on our children, on our grandchildren. And while adults might be able to, and I say might, be able to process perversity and have it not create too much harm, it's not so with kids. What kids are exposed to lives in their hearts and in their minds. It forms who they are. And to have things coming into our house that are perverse, to have things come into our house that use language that we would never use, to have pictures in that which are showing on a TV screen that we know shouldn't be showing within our own homes, let alone in front of our kids, or the access that they have to be able to walk past those things, is likened to having literally an open sewer running through the middle of your house. And whereas we might be able to step over it because we have longer legs, because we think that we're immune to it, the kids aren't. And they're going to wind up not only stepping in it, but they're going to wind up being influenced by it. And it's going to not only be something that they step in, but it's going to be something that finds its way into their hearts. And guys, we need to be very, very careful. In verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I don't see any coincidence whatsoever between this parable and it falling right after the parable that says, Guard against perversity. I, th I think that it's, that it's absolutely spot on in the way that it, it was organized by the Lord. 
And folks, I'm going to stay in the weeds for a little bit. So just buckle up, hang on, because I know that this is going to hit some of us in places where we don't want to hit it. It's going to be something that is going to, going to cause us to, to have to maybe struggle with some things that we know are in our lives that we need to look at. But guys, if we don't have a plan based upon what is coming against our kids, then we're going to fail them. The Lord says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Train up a child. Training requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of attention. This word train has a lot of different meanings. If you go up and you look even in Webster's 1828, if you go up and you look up there, a train is everything from a, a, a choo-choo to what follows behind a bride to all kinds of different events. But this particular word train has to do specifically with that which is tied to exercise. It's tied to discipline. It's to teach and to form by practice. It's to train as if the militia to use a manual as part of their exercise. And it's to train soldiers in the use of arms and tactics. This is a serious train. This isn't, oh, just influence or just do a drive-by. This is not osmosis. This isn't where you can just hope that you drive by something and it sticks. This is to purpose to have it to happen. And this is where we make application when it comes to the training of our children. We're to ask, are we exercising the conduct and the behaviors for our children that are godly? Are we training the discipline that is necessary for them to walk in the things of the Lord and not in the world? If you think that your child can withstand what's coming against them in the world without training, without exercise, without discipline, without encouragement, you're leaving them out there to be squandered. They're not going to be able to do it. Are we demonstrating by teaching, by form, and by practice what our kids need in order to stand against the enemy? Are we using the manual? <laughs> Are we using the right training manual in order to be able to demonstrate to them the truth of God that will allow them to be able to stand against that which is coming from the enemy? And are we teaching them to use arms and tactics? Arms. Well, we're not supposed to let kids play with even toy guns anymore, are we? No, no, no. We're talking about the armament that comes through the armor of God, through prayer, through worship, through the reading of God's Word, those types of things. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the whole letting kids play with guns. It's another day. Do we see even more so the role that we have as instructors where we are responsible, accountable to them and to God for training of our kids in order for them to stand in the battle against the enemy? We just finished our VBS for this year, and it was great. We had a bunch of kids that were running through. The whole place was decorated. We all taken all the decorations down. Although if you go upstairs, you'll see the guys with the swords and all this stuff. We, we put it up in the kids' wing in there because we want to remind the kids of what they learned. And what they learned is they learned about the armor of God, the whole armor of God. And why do you wear armor? What's the purpose for armor? It's protection. Well, if you think about it, the armor goes from head to toe. There are also, in addition to the protection, there are offensive weapons that are given. There's a shield that is used to be able to ward off blows, but also to be able to take and keep the enemy at bay in order for you to be able to have an opportunity to use the sword, which is then used to be able to defend yourself and to be able to defeat the enemy. And so we've spent all of that time in trying to bring the kids to the place of understanding what it is that they need to be properly armed for the battle. But I want you to listen carefully. As a church, we are always going to try to do whatever we can to help add to a child's training. We are. I say add to a child's training. VBS, Awana, Children's Church, all of the activities, the fact that we've always got to focus on where the kids are at and what they're learning. You know, we don't just house them in Children's Church. It's a time of instruction. It's a time of teaching. It's a time of training them every opportunity that we have. But let me tell you what, an hour on Sunday and an hour on Wednesday night or whenever they're here, even throughout the entire course, how many of you were here and participated with VBS? How many of you noticed on the first night, the kids really didn't know what to do. Oh, now some of them, because they've been going to VBS for a long time, they got it. But most of the kids were just like, when the song was playing, they were like going, they didn't know what to do. 
By the third night, man, they're doing the things and they're doing the, doing the songs. And by the last night, they're screaming at the top of their lungs. And you know why? Because for that period of time, for that week in their life, they were in a constant state of training. They were being trained. They were being exposed to away from the things of the world, and the focus was on the things of the Lord and the people of God and the, and the house of God where they were encouraged, where they were loved, where they were received, where they were accepted, and where they belonged. And because of that influence, we saw those kids grow tremendously in their strength during the course of that week. But the majority of training that is ever going to happen in the life of a child, the place where the basic training happens is in the home. It's in the home. And what takes place in the home and what our kids see is going to be demonstrated by those who are charged for training them is going to make all of the difference in the world. The question is, is what do your kids see? What does it see when it comes to your walk with the Lord? I mean, do they, do they see you depending upon God for your daily life? Is he the one that is ruling and reigning within your life? Do we seek to follow his commandments, and do we demonstrate the, the following of it, the, following the lead of the Holy Spirit? Are we leading and training by example when it comes to faithfulness, even in the little things, so that they recognize it? And guys, if you don't think they do, they watch everything. I think it's so funny when parents say, well, we try not to argue in front of the kids. I'm like, quit trying. They know when you guys aren't getting along. They know when things are going, oh, well, we don't ever, you know, we go out in the garage and scream and yell at each other. Great. You don't think that they're like listening to what's going on out in the garage? The examples are pouring out all over the place. Kids are so perceptive. They are like sponges. They walk through the room and it, whatever you're putting off, they're sucking up. And it's going to stick. It's the little things that are often the most impressive for kids. I can remember a time. I don't remember which kid. Maybe one of them is back here, and they'll put their hand up if it was them. I don't remember. But we were out on a shopping trip, and we had gone through and did the cash, cashier thing and paid for everything and, and, and didn't realize it, but the cashier had made a mistake, and they had given us too much money back. And as we're walking out of the store, I get about halfway to the car, and I realize it. Now, the fact that I was doing math, if you know me, that was the first miracle, all right? Because I recognized it was just like, hey, boy, something's wrong. I know that what we purchased was more than this, and I got way too much. Thank you, Lord, for that affirmation. Yeah. But we turned around. I looked, I looked at it. Was that one of you guys when we turned around? We went back in the store. Was that you? It was, it was Catherine, okay. We went back into the store, right? And it wasn't that she didn't understand. She kind of got it, but it was just kind of one of those situations where it, it, was, it was not worth who I am for whatever it was. And it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough that I figured that it was going to cause a problem for the cashier at the end of her shift. And the last thing that she wanted to do is have her drawer come up short, and maybe it would cause... And it was like, it's just the right thing to do. You don't walk out because they forgot to give you something or undercharged you and not make it right. So we went back in. We had to stand in line again. Now i got to wait to make it right. That's even worse, right? And so we're standing in line. We finally get up there, and I, and I, ask the, 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 or I tell the, the, the checker, I say, you know, I think you made a mistake, and she instantly bristled. And I said, I think you gave me too much change. And then she wanted to argue with me. And so I showed her the receipt, and I told her what we got, and she finally realized that I was trying to do something that was in her favor and not trying to do something the other way around. But let me tell you what the cool part was is I watched without really paying attention, but saw it more in, in, in the after effect. I watched my daughter watch me do the right thing. And how cool was that? Over something so in, 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 insignificant. She wouldn't have even known if I'd have just thought, hey, <laughs> score. <laughs> Stupid checker. <laughs> Guys, they watch everything. And who we are and the things that we do, if we're faithful and little, then we'll be put in charge of much. And the much that we're in charge of is our kids. The world wants to tell us that there's another process, though. Their instruction when it comes to raising kids has to do with letting them make up their own minds. Don't force your will or your ways on them because you'll stifle their creativity. You may crush their self-esteem and their personality. 
Go ahead. Because they're not in a position to be able to take and figure out what it is that they're supposed to be doing without proper direction. And it's better, the world says, to just let them figure it out on their own. Guys, I'll tell you that that is, without exception, a lie straight from the pit of hell. It is. Because while parents are letting their kids figure it out on their own and not forcing or enforcing the things of God in their lives, the world is indoctrinating them. The world is doing everything that it can, telling our kids that they're not made in the image of God, that they can create themselves in any image that they want. They can be anything they want to be. If you can imagine it, you can identify as it, and then you can be such. And if anyone tells you that you're wrong or that anything different than that aspect of it, then they're the ones who are evil. They're the ones that are doing something and promoting that which is wrong. Guys, I want to tell you something very clearly. There has been and never will be a six-year-old boy that has the mental capacity to be able to identify as a girl. It doesn't happen. It's not natural. It's not right. That's being enforced. It's being indoctrinating. It's being something that is being placed within the heart and the mind of our kids. Right now, basically what's happening is, is that hell is running the training program for the kids in this country. And if we're not aware of that, then we won't be prepared to do anything about it. Years ago, when I was in the military, not nearly many, many years ago as, as it was for Gordon, he told me that tonight is his 60th anniversary of when he got his wings as an Air Force pilot. <laughs> Pretty cool. But they had a way of doing things, at least when I was in boot camp. I don't know if they still do it this well, but the, way, but the goal was to create a unified fighting force. Everyone was supposed to know a certain level of basic tactics, and the tactics were vital. We were expected to follow the training that we received, and we marched for miles. We ran for miles in full gear. We trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. We ran through the mud and through the snow and over obstacles, and, and we had to demonstrate proficiency with rifles and other weapons and all of these things in order to be able to meet this particular standard. And then we were also supposed to follow the orders of our superior officers, there was a chain of command. It didn't matter if you liked it or not. It didn't matter if you agreed with it. If it came from a higher or a superior officer, you had one answer. Yes, sir. Now picture a boot camp where soldiers are told, just do your own thing. Just do what you feel like and just identify as whatever you want to be. Don't worry about learning tactics that you don't like. And when it comes to time to battle, only follow the orders that you agree with. Only follow the ones that make you feel special. The world is setting up our kids for destruction. And those charged with training them are the ones that very often are advocating. We've got to step in. We've got to save them from what's happening. If we don't, they're going to suffer devastating consequences. Where it starts... First, we have to recognize that there's a battle. <sighs> Guys, we've got to recognize that the battle that is coming against our kids is purposed and it's real, and there's a real enemy. And because of that, if we fail to prepare, then we are leaving them to their own, and on their own, they cannot survive. Our kids are being led by the father of lies into the lies that are governing their lives, the lie that there's no God, that they don't have to listen to anything, that they don't want to listen to, that they don't have to comply with anything that is a standard, whereas God's word clearly says that we are to train up a child. Train them up. We need to take it seriously. Understand there's a chain of command. God is at the top. When it comes to the family unit, the parents are at the next level. The child then becomes the object of the concern of both God and from, and from the parents. And guys, listen, don't ever, ever, ever think that you have to advocate your responsibility, your accountability, your position and place of authority over your kid to a government program or to the schools. Don't ever give them the authority to train your child outside of what it is that you want them to learn, knowing that they need to have this in order to survive what's coming. And guys, this is what's taken. This is what we're being told we have to do. I can't tell you how many school boards across the country are talking about how parents have no say. No say. 
You're responsible for training up your child. God has made you and those that are responsible to those kids responsible to him. Now, I know that every time that I talk about something like this that everybody got really quiet. But there are things that we can do that make a difference. The first thing that we have to do, though, is we have to acknowledge that there's something that has to be done. And we have to be willing to change our minds as it pertains to that which must be done in order for the Spirit to come and to change our hearts. And what I will tell you is if you'll change your mind, the Spirit will empower you and give you opportunity to be able to take and to do exactly what it is that your child needs to be trained up in the Lord. Verse 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the servant to the lender. At some point in time, if you haven't, I want to know how, found yourself in the place of owing somebody else money. You're either too young or you've been able to just avoid it your entire life. Most of us wind up having a debt at some point in time. Very often it's homes or it's cars, large purchase items, things of that nature. But there's been a trend for many, many years, this mindset that allows for the financing of lifestyle that includes just every aspect of life, anything that we would want. Things from essentials essentials to instant gratification can be easily put on a credit card. And the mindset is, as long as you can make the payment, then you can afford it. But God never intended us to finance a lifestyle. He never intended us to use credit as a means of sustaining our lives because the lender becomes the master over the borrower. And we can easily become slaves to the debt if we don't find ourselves liberated from it to the point that one paycheck away, one paycheck withheld, can mean total destruction in somebody's life. And I got to it. There were times in my life where I was, I was in that place. I mean, I was in that place that if there was a shortage, if there was a problem, there were times when, when, it, was, when it was just perfectly clear that there was not going to be enough money left at the end of the month. There was way too much month left. And something had to change and something had to be done. And yet the Lord will tell us that we're not supposed to put ourselves into the place of finding ourselves in debt for more than we can pay back. Simply, don't ever borrow what you can't pay. If you don't have the money for it, wait for it. Don't go into debt to the point that you've got to come up with something in order just to be able to sustain. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail, and he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Cast out the scoffer, and the contentious contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. Have you guys ever had a scoffer in your life? You know, that person that just either doesn't like God or does everything that they can do just to try to set you off because they know that you do. And it's not too bad if it's somebody that you don't know very well. If it's just a casual acquaintance, you can just write them off and leave them alone and avoid them, right? If it's a boss or a co-worker, it's a little more difficult. Maybe then it's just a matter of trying to draw some sort of boundary, some sort of opportunity for you to be able to maintain your sanity around somebody that is just doing everything they can to just push your buttons when it comes to the God that you serve. I can remember, I don't know how many times, that having a particular boss that you should just tell me, consider, whether I was or not, he would look at me and say, well, you need to, you need to get out of preacher mode. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. <laughs> And we need to make sure that we're in this position to where we are not willing to give up that of who we are based upon what's going on. But you know when it's really impossible? When it's a family member. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up because we all at some point in time have probably engaged a family member that is just such a scoffer when it comes to the things of God and the things that mean something within our lives. And guys, understand that Scripture tells us very clearly that we are to, as best as it is and as much as it is up to us, to try to live at peace with all people. We're supposed to try to live at peace. You know what creates peace sometimes? Space. Distance. The further I can get away from a scoffer, regardless of if they're an acquaintance, a, a, a relative, or just somebody that I work with, the more distance that I can put between me and them brings more peace. And there's times when it's the only solution that we have to separate ourselves out. I can't tell you how many folks that I've talked to that just dread going home for that family event. You know when it hits? 
Thanksgiving and Christmas. <sighs> what's the matter? I'm going home for Thanksgiving. Well, what's the problem? <sighs> My family will be there. <laughs> okay, well, isn't that a good thing? Oh, no, 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 no. The minute I hit the door, they're going to start in on me. The minute that we sit down for dinner, if I say that we need to say grace, oh, man, is it going to hit the fan? They're going to go berserk. They're going to go nuts because for them, Turkey Day is all about the football and stuffing their faces. It has nothing to do with being thankful for the blessings that the Lord has given us. And he said, every time that I try to bring it up, said, I'll, I'll walk into the house and, and, and they'll say, hey, how are you? And I'll say, blessed in the Lord. And boy, we're, all right, we're at it. At odds for that. I said, then don't say that. Huh? I said, then don't say that. I said, if you know that they're going to scoff, if you know that they're going to give you a hard time, if you're going to walk in and your only purpose to be there is because you're trying to honor your family and you want to be able to be at peace to the best of your ability, then don't do anything to antagonize them. Pray for them in the spirit. Don't, don't antagonize them and say stuff out loud. They're not going to receive it. They're just going to get upset. I said, and the cool thing about it is, is if you don't push the issue, if they sit down for dinner and they all look at you because they know you're going to ask to pray and you don't, it will freak them out. For a minute, they'll think they've won, but then they'll know you're up to something. <laughs> and just be conscious, and just be nice, and just be loving. And if they ask you, well, why aren't you talking about You can just say, you know what? I just didn't want to argue with you this time. I just figured that I would just love you in spite of who you are. <laughs> <laughs> he who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. And the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the faithless. And a lazy man says, there's a lion outside, and I shall be slain in the streets. I find it to be very true that lazy people will very often make excuses for not trying at all. If a person is truly lazy and there's an opportunity for them, and, and you've dealt with this person where you've tried to help someone and you've given them opportunity to be able to do something, but they just don't respond. And it's like, man, you need, to, you need to be willing to at least engage and at least be able to take a chance. And a lot of folks will say, as this one here says, Solomon says, this man won't even go outside because there's danger out there. There's, there can be lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Oh my. So I'm not going to go outside for fear that I'm going to run into some danger. And the reality is, is that life is full of danger. Life is full of danger. You know that you can succumb to a variety of things. We could be, we could be hit by lightning even where we're sitting here. And it could travel down that beam and it could hit that beam and bounce off of Michael and hit Jason and roll over to, to, to Dave and wipe out the whole back row. It certainly can't come this way because I'm insulated. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know what is going to happen in relationship to the dangers that are out there. But guys, if we never went outside because we were afraid that there was something that was dangerous out there, we would never live. We would not have any life. And so it comes down to this aspect of understanding that sometimes the purpose in not trying, the purpose in not taking things on is literally because we're lazy. Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite founding fathers, I, 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 he gets such a bad rap, and you need to go read his stuff. I mean, they want to make him out to be a drunkard and a womanizer and all. Go read his stuff. Go read the stuff that he wrote and the quotes that he has. He had this to say about lazy people. He said, laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him. So the only thing wrong with doing nothing is that you never know when you're finished. I love this stuff. <laughs> Don't be afraid to go into the streets. If God is for us, who can be against us? The mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit, and he who is aboard by the Lord will fall there. Our modern culture has done more harm to women than it has ever done to help them. The Lord's design for women as wives and as mothers, as wise managers of their household, has long been shattered by a movement towards liberation, by sensualizing women as sexual objects rather than being the value that God has placed upon them. And then we add into it, and today our modern aspect of this demonic 
gender confusion. And guys, there's no wonder that there's this huge divide in relationship to what it is that, that we're supposed to be within the Lord. And I'm always saddened when I hear this aspect of, of, of vulgarity and profanity used as a common means of conversation. And you know, more and more, it's like, man, you can't be anywhere where people have any sense of, of their words meaning anything. I mean, it's amazing in, in, in the places that I find... It, and, I, and I, won't, I, won't, I don't think it's anybody in this room, so I'll only talk bad about those that aren't here tonight. <laughs> There's times when people don't even recognize it and realize it. I had somebody come up to me once in church after a message and said, Pastor, that was one hell of a message. I said, Lord, I hope not. <laughs> and he went, oh, a heck of a message. That, that, was a, that was a good, and he just started, guys, we had to be careful of how it is that we allow that which we say to be a part of just our natural conversation. And when we see this and we see what's happening here, guys, I, I don't think that it's ever fitting for a man. And I think that it is absolutely just horrific in the mouth of a woman. Now, personally, now, I know there's going to be those that are going to look at me and say, wow, you're just old-fashioned. You are one of those people. I am, and I admit it, whatever that is. But guys, it goes back to training our children. Boys should be trained up to be gentlemen and be men of God. And young ladies, girls need to be brought into the fact of knowing that they are going to become a young woman and one who is poised with godly character. And we need to be training that into them, this idea that they get to be whatever they are, whatever someone else tells them to be. Guys, don't think for a moment that that's a decision that the child is making. It's something that is being put into their hearts and their minds by the enemy, and it's a lie. A child comes to you and tells you that they want to be something that they're not, check the source. It's not the child. You take them to the place of truth. Again, some will be offended by what I just said. Take it up with God. As he says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. How many have had foolishness driven out of you by the rod? My dad did not have a... I think this was one of my dad's favorite verses. Whenever there was fearlessness in my heart, it caused my dad's belt to loosen. Open up, and then you heard... As it came out of the buckles and out of the loops on his pants. Over the years, this whole area of discipline, again, has been subject to attack by the enemy and controversy. And the bottom line is, is that if we will do things God's way, then God's plan will work. Our kids will grow up to fear the Lord and not be foolish. Any act of discipline of a child, though, that is void of the influence of God's word and his heart is not going to work. You can't drive foolishness away from the heart of a child unless there is something to replace it with. And so when we look at this aspect of discipline in an ungodly world, when we look at parents who are brought to the place of using frustration and anger and, and, and a need to try to control or dominate their kids and they're exposing them to what is literally abuse by virtue of corporal punishment, if it's not done with the purpose of pointing them to God, then it is inappropriate and wrong. Can I tell you how many times I've been standing in a store and just watch somebody just wail on a kid and it's everything I can do to keep from going to jail. There's, there's been so many times and it's like if you're going to take and correct, we need to do so in the way that the Lord has prescribed. And what the Lord has said is that if necessary and when necessary, that we need to be willing to use even that that brings a child pain in order to set them back on the right path but it's done in love, and it's done with the purpose of leading them back to the Lord, not just demonstrating who's bigger, who's more powerful, and who's got the authority. And if we'll do it that way, then we'll see our kids walk in a fashion that is worthy. I think it's also in, significant that it talks about the rod. It talks about an object rather than the hand, and I think that there's something very special about this. <laughs> Around my house, it was, a, it was a, a belt and a spoon. Wooden spoons are great, man. I mean, wooden spoons work, right? The object that brought the discipline is not to be the same as the hand which receives the repentant heart.
and brings comfort. And so it's important and significant that we see that. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. God is always looking out for the poor, and we know that, and he warns us against oppressing them. And there should never be a time when a Christian takes advantage of anyone as a means for personal gain. As we look at verse 17, we see that it's going to change in its, in its style. Rather than it being a contrast, it's now more conversational. And he says in verse 17, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them be fixed upon your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. I've instructed you today, even you. And Solomon says that he wants, you to, wants us to listen and to apply the things that he says. And he says, you'll do well. He's telling us these things for our own good. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge, that you may make known the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you? He says, my child, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth in love. So you'll know how to answer when somebody challenges what you believe. And guys, this is huge. And this goes back again to training up a child. One of the things that we have to understand, one of the greatest failures that we see within the, the, the church happens to the youth that leave out of here that have been brought up in the church and go to the universities. And what they say is that almost 75 to 80% of the youth that will leave an active life in the church and they go to a public university will lose their faith in the first year because they don't know how to challenge or defend against the challenges of their faith that are brought to them. They don't know what to say. They, don't know, they know what they believe or they've been told what they believe, but they don't know why they believe it and they don't feel confident and competent to be able to stand and defend their faith in such a way that causes them not to succumb and to give in. And guys, we need to be very aware that this is one of those areas where we have to train them up or we set them up to be casualties of war. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul who's plundered them. Make no friend with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. And do not be one of those who shakes the hand in pledge of one who's surety for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take away your bed from under you? Again, don't spend what you don't, God. Do not remove the ancient landmark for which your fathers have set. And do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Guys, the whole church and this God thing you guys realize that, well, it's kind of old school, right? Says the world. The Bible is really outdated. I mean, it isn't really for today. It's not for our modern culture. I mean, there's things in there that just don't line up with what we know to be true today. Times have changed. The church needs to change in order to stay up with them. And the Old Testament, it's old, kind of irrelevant now. I mean, do we really need it? I mean, I mean, God's word, is it really? And these are the things that we hear. These are the things that are being pushed and being promoted in relationship to what's happening. Guys, let me tell you what. The word of God is every bit as effective. It is every bit as true. It is every bit sharper than a two-edged sword as it ever would. And it cut, cuts between the marrow and between the heart, and it separates truth from the lie. God's word has not changed. It doesn't change. It hasn't become void. The landmarks that were set by our fathers are just as relevant today as they were back in that day. Solomon was the, believed to be the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. And one of the things that he declared after everything that he learned in his life, with all of the wisdom, all of the knowledge, all of the things that he knew, was that there is nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. It does. Whether we remember it or not, because man hasn't changed. The nature of man has not changed. But guys, even more so, the nature of God has not changed. God hasn't changed. We need not to be afraid that what we would put our faith in is in any way, shape, or form going to not be true today 
for tomorrow or forever. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come together and learn from your word. And Lord, I, I recognize whenever we talk about responsibilities, and especially when we start pulling on the heartstrings about kids and grandkids and family and all of the things that go with it, Lord, that there is a, a need for us to take and to just really go before you. And Lord, ask you to take by virtue of us changing our mind and saying, yes, Lord, whatever you would have me to do, I'm willing to put my will into it, then Lord, by virtue of that change of mind, you will change our hearts. You will provide to us the inspiration, the wisdom, the knowledge that we need. When we fear you, when we acknowledge you, your wisdom becomes available to us. And may it be that we would apply that wisdom in our, in our families, to our kids, to our grandkids, to those that we have opportunity to influence, rescuing them and saving them from a world that is looking to destroy them. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together. The splendor of the king clothed in majesty all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice I'll bring
do that next song. Then sings my soul. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. God bless you all. Go out and be salt and light in this world. Share the love of God wherever you go. We'll see you on Sunday.